County, and then the Charter School Authority, which is fabulous. That's awesome. Excellent. I know a guy who yeah, might be able to help with that charter school thing. Nice. Well, it's good. It's good to start start this off with some good news. That's for sure. Um, tough times require some good news, and it's it's nice for all of us to be able to share that with you. Uh, since it's 1201, we'll go ahead and uh, just roll right on into um, our program. So I'll just go ahead and kick things off. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Christine Brown. I'm the Director of Member Engagement here at the Reno Sparks Chamber, and we're lucky to have our CEO, Ann Silver, on today. Um, and Connor, our Director of Operations, is on the call as well. We're all really excited to uh, to just sit under this teaching today and receive these tools and, and hopefully you know help each other, but also help our members as well. And so I thank you to all of you who are uh, members of the chamber who hopped on today, those of you who are not yet members of the chamber who have hopped on today. Uh, we are closing in on the end of this Chamber EDU Fall Workshop Series, and uh, we've, we've been so thrilled to offer uh, uh, tons of workshops and tons of extra credit Zoom seminars throughout the entire fall season. We're coming in on the close, only a couple more left to go before the holidays really come into full swing and we all kind of fall into the holiday days, as it were, holidays. Um, but in December, about mid-December, we'll be announcing um, all of our workshops for quarter one, and we are so thrilled. We got some great feedback from our members uh, from a recent survey that are guiding guiding our curriculum and guiding our choices, and we're, we're, off, we're excited to offer relevant options to folks in the new year. And I'm sure that we will be revisiting uh, mental health at some point uh, with, with Misty and or Jake. And so we're thrilled not only to have them today, but to have them as, as members and, and valued educational partners here at the chamber. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and uh, toss it over first to Jake. I'll let him introduce himself. And then uh, Misty, we'll go ahead and have you introduce yourself and then we'll go ahead and launch into presentations. Yeah, a uh, brief uh, verbal resume, I guess. Uh, Jake Wiskirchen is how you pronounce that last name. I am a marriage and family therapist uh, by trade and a national certifi certified counselor. I co-own and operate a company called Zephyr Wellness that does outpatient mental health in Reno and Sparks in greater northern Nevada. We've served probably seven different counties over the last five and a half years we've been around. Um, I wear a lot of hats um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, how to deal with workplace mental stress. And um, it's going to be just a, the briefest of overviews, um, but I'm basically going to teach emotional functioning and how to work with within that sphere uh, with your employees and um, and how to maybe uh, help people help shepherd people through their stressful times. So, uh, Misty. Good morning, everyone. My name is Misty Vaughn Allen. I'm the Suicide Prevention Coordinator for the state of Nevada. And at one point, I wanted to be like Jake. Um, I wanted to be a marriage and family therapist, but I started at the Crisis Call Center Hotline in the 90s, I will tell you, and um, that became my passion. And I still adore it. And I'll be, be um, giving you ideas and support if the mental health um, regulation and, and what you offer your employees and your families kicks into a crisis level. So uh, mine will be very brief as well, but we want to make sure you're going into the holidays with some tools. And I will state, if this brings up some thoughts for yourself or your loved ones or colleagues, I'm going to be monitoring the chat. So don't hesitate to ask questions if you don't want to do it verbally with Jake. And then I'm also going to give you my cell phone and the hotline, the national hotline um, for down the road if you need to reach out to someone. All okay. right. Carry away. Thank you so much. And, and I appreciate both of your availability today, but also your generosity in providing, uh, providing yourselves as resources to our members into the future as well. So thank you. Um, and just a quick note on the Q&A, we are reserving time at the end for Q&A. Again, as Misty said, to reiterate, if you don't feel comfortable posing your question uh, verbally or on video or on audio, please feel free to use the chat. You can always send a private message through the chat function to any one of us. So please feel free to use that as an option. And um, I believe we are starting now with Jake. So Jake, go ahead and uh, take it away and kick us off. All right, I'll just do it the old fashioned way because Alt A wasn't working. So for starters, I guess, uh, even though I'm a clinician, um, I'm, I'm a boss too, and I, and I supervise interns and um, 
and students. So one of the proud things that we did, probably the proudest thing I've done in my career is we host graduate practicum students who are achieving their uh, graduate level hours so they can uh, get their degree and move on to licensure. And what that allows us to do is see people without um, regard for insurance coverage or, uh, you know, even if they uh, have an ability to pay or not ability to pay or their deductibles too high or whatever. So in doing so, we're shepherding all these new clinicians into the, into the field and, and so forth. But um, I have to be mindful as, you know, boss to these people that even though we're clinicians in the clinical realm and we're supposed to be good at this stuff, we're humans. And a lot of what I'm going to present here is stuff that I constantly go back to. So this emotional functioning presentation really serves as the foundation of all my clinical interventions. And then I integrate some other theories alongside of it. But this is so critical to human functioning that I think everybody should know it. And it's really just not part of any curricula. So uh, I am going to go over some stats because stats are fun and um, but they can be boring. So there's only like four slides. So I call this emotional non-functioning, <laughs> parenthetically non and if you do have comments, go ahead and throw them in the chat and I'll try to monitor that as quickly as I can. Um, I have done this a few times, so we, uh, we can take some questions as I go too. We don't have to hold them all till the end. So check this out. The CDC does a survey in um, you know, like, like of homes throughout the, the course of the, the year and they take a break in summertime. But last year, January to June, you see the stats there. So. About 8% of uh, people had anxiety symptoms, 6.5% had depressive symptoms, and about 11% had, had you know, either. Um, why those numbers don't add together, I have no idea, but this is, this is just how they, uh, they pull their people. So let me show you some slides of this year, because we've been in COVID times, and COVID sucks for everybody. I want to draw attention here to the, the top line, United States, and you'll see that I toggled it. This is a screenshot, so it's not live, but you see symptoms of anxiety disorder or depressive disorder. So national, look at July 16th through 21, up 40% of people in the country were experiencing something. Now, do you remember the previous slide? It was 11. Now look at 18 to 29 year olds we're in the 50% range. I mean, we're looking at half our population is struggling with some symptoms of anxious, anxiety or depressive uh, experience. And you can see the, the, uh, the resilience, I think, is what speaks to the age demographics. It the percentages tend to drop as you get older. And my, my interpretation of that and some, some literature has been written that the older we get in life, the more we've experienced and the, the more used to things we are. So uh, I'll get more into that in the presentation. The idea of distress tolerance is something that I'm going to present to you too. So the more life you live, the higher your distress tolerance tends to be. So next slide here. This is the trend line of these survey questions. So uh, higher in April. And if, if we could go back to March, it was actually closer to 40%. And then it dips a little bit in May, comes back up, slight dip here in June, and then it and then it climbs. Again, no interpretation of this other than my own. But what happened in late May? Well, um, phase one, uh, we had lockdowns in March and April, and then we started to relax those. People started to get out, doing things, um, being together a little bit. And then it just sort of climbed after that because we started seeing surges and obviously in July was the, the big spike and that's when everybody freaked out again and we had to roll back some of those, those relaxed restrictions and make it more restrictive. And the correlation here is, is simply to suggest that humans need interconnectivity and I'll talk about that in a little bit too. So it's no surprise that our reports of anxious and depressive symptoms would diminish when we're all starting to get back out and connect with one another again. Uh, you see Nevada, we're proudly holding down the bottom or near it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the ranking the states report that's published by Mental Health America annually has Nevada 51st in the country in behavioral health care uh, access and provision. And the way they weigh that out, there's like 17 different criteria that they use. And all told, we're, we're 51st when you factor in the District of Columbia. And we've been there for several years, and it's uh, very upsetting. But they take into consideration things like provider availability, um, uh, number of reported cases, number of diagnoses, uh, people's ability to recover, that kind of thing. So Nevada sucks at everything we're not supposed to suck at. Here's the original slide. 
here's our new numbers. So you can see that we've essentially gone up, you know, four to five times depending on your demographic from 2019 to 2020. It's not good. It's affecting our work productivity. It's affecting our relationships and um, all sorts of things have stemmed from these lockdowns specific to education because I happen to be sitting in a school right now. It turns out that in Nevada, 75% of our mandated reporters are teachers. So what does a mandated reporter do? Well, we're, we're mandated by law to report suspected abuse, neglect, or isolation of what are called vulnerable populations. And those vulnerable populations typically are the elderly, uh, the handicapped, and children, uh, broadly speaking. So when children don't have eyeballs on them, such as when they're in distance learning, we don't have an ability to report suspected child abuse. So child abuse cases have actually diminished by 45%, or at least that was the latest statistic that I saw back in April. Now, did child abuse actually drop by half? Probably not. The reporting dropped. And that's problematic because I've seen some other literature that suggests that when not reported and authorities can't intervene in these uh, abusive and neglectful homes, the symptoms actually get worse and the children end up suffering worse injuries and worse neglect. And uh, that's really bad because then they show up in the emergency room instead of the social service office. Um, we've, we've all heard the reports on things like, you know, people being afraid to go get uh, tested for, you know, get their cancer screenings or get their, their, um, their tests for, for blood work done for heart problems and so on and so forth. So we've got a number of public health outcomes that aren't COVID related that are significantly affecting our population. And as a result, people are stressed out about it. So this makes sense. It's not just simply my gosh, there's this virus out there that I could get and, and I could fall ill. It's I'm worried about my, my personal health. I'm worried about my family's health. I'm worried about my job. I'm worried about uh, the economic situation. You know, how long is this going to last? And then, and then, of course, there's this kind of crisis in perpetuity that we're not prepared for either. When is the end? We don't really know. So we'll move on to the next slide here and I'll start talking about emotions. So if this were a live class and I had more time, I would pull the audience and I'd say, how many emotions do you think you have? And people would give answers anywhere from a lot to a million to seven to whatever. Well, the, the research that I use is from a guy named Carol Izzard, two R's and two L's in Carol, uh, I-Z-A-R-D. It's like a lizard, but without the L. He taught emotions for some 30 odd years at the University of Delaware, but he studied them for close to five decades. And what he found through his research is that these 10 are unique in and of themselves uh, in their function in the brain. So I'm going to do this a lot and I'm going to look like a third base coach or a, a manager giving pitch signals, but really I'm pointing to logic and limbic in the brain. So logic is your prefrontal cortex, your frontal lobe. That's where uh, analysis and what we call your executive functioning comes from reason, um, so on and so forth. The, the emotional part here and back, it's like the middle rear part of the brain, uh, that is responsible for your feeling, essentially. So here's the 10 emotions. Anger, fear, sadness, shame. And then don't worry about writing these down. I can send a, a PDF to Christine and she can disseminate it if she wants. Um, disgust, surprise, excitement, happiness or joy, and then contempt. And these all can occur on a continuum as well. So a little tiny bit of sadness might be called disappointment. So I might experience this if I go into Burger King and I ask for a Whopper and uh, Dr. Pepper and they say, hey, we're cooking your Whopper. Here's the cup. Go get your Dr. Pepper. And I walk over to the soda machine and I put it up to the soda machine and click uh, soda water comes up. No Dr. Pepper. Hmm. I'm sad. It's disappointment. Um, sadness is function, and these all have a function. And I'll talk about that in a few slides. Sadness is function is simply to tell us that our expectations were not met. So a lot of people look at this list and they go, oh, there's seven of them that are negative and three that are positive. And, it's, and that's not what it is. It's not positive or negative. It's they are simply instructive. They tell us what's going on in the environment. In other words, they, they perform what's called an adaptive function, meaning we adapt to what's going on around us so that we can better move through it. Sadness is function is to tell us our expectations were not met. If I'm okay with tolerating that sadness, I can move on and grab Pepsi or something. I don't start, you know, MF and the manager and screaming and shouting and saying, how dare you not have my Dr. Pepper? I don't reach for anger, right? Uh, so I can tolerate my sadness and move on. So here's, here's the book by Izzard. It's called The Psychology of Emotions. He literally wrote the book on the psychology of emotions. And it's very, very good. It's kind of hard to find now, but this is kind of my Bible for, for what I'm doing. 
All right. So if I were on a whiteboard, I would be drawing these images, but instead you get my um, crappy little uh, Microsoft Paint uh, interpretation of, the, of what I'm doing here. So this is a brain uh, with apologies that I am not an artist, I am a therapist. This is the best drawing I can do of a brain. And uh, if you look at this, that's the brain stem coming down here. So in the frontal lobe, you've got, uh, sorry, I'm going to start with the amygdala. Apparently the amygdala is a gland that stimulates your fight or flight reflex. Sometimes you might hear it as fight, flight, or freeze. So what this does, the first thing that react when, uh, environment throws stimulus at you. Now, if we were in the classroom, I would, uh, I would toss something at someone to stimulate that. So usually I'm holding a pen cause I'm drawing on the whiteboard and I would throw a pen at somebody and say, uh, you know, what'd you feel? And they're like, well, surprise. Right? So what that amygdala does, is um, it kicks into motion the, the rest of the limbic system. So I'm gonna skip ahead here. So we got the prefrontal cortex or frontal lobe, which does the thinking, reason, analysis, logic, um, part of our brain. And then we got the amygdala, which is the limbic, connected to the limbic system. The limbic system does a little curly cue in the middle of the brain. And what I want you to conceptualize here is thinking and feeling as two tanks connected by a mutual common pipe. If you're in thinking mode, you're not in feeling mode. And vice versa. If you're if you've got a full flood of emotions, not a lot of reason and logic are are operating. And a good way to to demonstrate this is the last time you had a really good, strong knockdown, drag out fight with a loved one or a best friend or something. Uh, there's not a lot of reason in that conversation. It's a lot of yelling and screaming, right? Um, so what we want to do is we want to be mindful of how our brain works. It's not that feeling is turned off all the time when you're in logic mode, like we are in logic mode right now. I'm talking about the fundamentals of neurochemicals and uh, you're listening and there's not a lot of emotion. There's not a lot of feeling. But if I throw that marker at you, uh, it should surprise you. You blink, you reflex, you do something. You don't think about the marker. You don't an analyze it as it's coming to you. You don't go, is this a friendly marker paying me a visit? Does it have a camera on it? Is it full of ink? <laughs> like we just, we just flinch, right? So as we move through that, our, our tanks would then invert. Feeling goes up and thinking goes down. The amygdala flares and we're unable to receive logical discourse. We can't receive new information when we're in a heightened emotional state. Stick with me. I promise this will all make sense at the end. Prefrontal cortex shuts off and we're, we're in that spastic mode, right? Here's the key though. It only lasts about three to nine seconds. Anytime an event occurs in your life. So I'm sitting in this classroom here and if maybe the fire alarm went off, um, it would trigger my brain First surprise, because surprise acts as a reboot mechanism to the system. It tells me that I wasn't prepared for whatever happened. And then probably something else kicks in, maybe fear, because fire alarms are usually associated with fire and an emergency. And then if I can tolerate that for a few seconds, I can return to logic. I can return to thinking mode and then work my way through. Okay, grab my bag. My shoes happen to be off right now because I'm comfortable. You guys can't see that, but it's okay. I would put my shoes on because it's kind of cold outside and I don't want to walk in the rocks with my socks on. And then I would make my way to the door and I would, you know, follow the flow of traffic out of the building. But I'm in my logic mode at that point. I've suppressed the feeling. I, otherwise, I might paralyze. That's part of the freeze, the fight, flight, or freeze. I could freeze. I could run screaming, you know, um, or if I'm in the middle of a forest and there's like a bee that flies around me, I can be like, ah! that would be like the fighting mode. I'm trying to get it off of me. All right. So here's their adaptive functions. Anger. A lot of people these days are trying to get rid of anger. We don't want to get rid of anger. Anger is necessary. It's required. What it does is it motivates us. Most, most of these emotions are motivational, but this one tells us that we need to make change. So uh, if I'm pissed off every day I come into work, I should probably find a new job. Actually, if I'm pissed off every day I come into work, I would have a bigger problem because I own the company. That would be, that'd be very strange. So, um, but, it, but it motivates us. And uh, one story I like to tell is uh, Tom Brady, the 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 quarterback for the now Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, used to be with the Patriots for a long time. He's won a bunch of Super Bowls, played at a high level. One day following, I think it was his third Super Bowl victory, somebody was interviewing and says, you know, how do you find your motivation? Like most guys with your level of success would just coast at this point. And, you know, but you're still out there really hungry, working hard, learning. And he looks at the interviewer and he goes, you do realize I was drafted in the sixth round, right? Like dude's still upset. And that's okay. He channels his anger into uh, film study and the opponent and gym workouts and diet and all that stuff. He doesn't go home and like yell at his spouse and kick his cat. 
uh, for some reason, he's a cat guy in my head. I don't know why, but um, that's appropriate use of anger. He channels it into something productive. It motivates him to make change. It's, you know, he's given the middle finger to like 31 other teams that passed him over. So fear, fear lets us know that danger is present or a threat is present. Um, this is useful because if there's a threat present, we want to take note of that neurologically and then logically move through what we're supposed to do. So if I'm walking through the forest and a snake jumps in my path, and maybe I know snakes really well, I can analyze the snake. Like Initially, I'm going to have a fear response because snakes are dangerous and all that stuff. But then I can look and be like, oh, it's not rattling at me. It doesn't seem to be coiled up. Oh, it's just a garter snake. Um, we can just let it go about its way and walk along. We don't have to worry about getting bit, right? Because I've allowed logic to take over. I've, I've worked on, on understanding what my own emotion is and learning from it. A lot of people will, uh, will get angry on the highway when somebody cuts them off at a high rate of speed. Uh, we call that road rage. And we go, whoa, you know, why, why are you angry? What can you motivate to, to change in that situation? The answer is really nothing. Because what anger is doing in that moment is acting for, as a proxy for the fear that you should be feeling. Because it's scary to be cut off on a highway, you know, going 70 miles an hour by, you know, by another 5,000 pound car that's also going 70 miles an hour. What we should do, though, is learn to tolerate our fear. Who pump the brakes, you know, give space, let the car move around, check our passengers, whatnot. We don't have to reach for anger to cover up the fear. Sadness then. Sadness occurs when our expectations were not met. I already covered that. Great sadness, by the way, on the other end of the continuum might be something called anguish uh, or despair. Shame and guilt. I'm going to go over these real quick. So shame tells us that we didn't meet others' expectations, meaning we caused sadness in somebody else. And then guilt says, hey, go make it right. Go go apologize, you know, offer flowers, whatever it is. What's interesting about shame and guilt is that a lot of, again, a lot of pop psychology and culture is telling us that we should, we need to eliminate shame. And that's not healthy. Uh, this is, again, this is a neurological function that we have that's necessary to adapt to our environments. And I'll tell, I'll talk about the the social ramifications of that in a minute. If we eliminate shame, what we're essentially doing is we're eliminating the process by which people can reconcile with one another. So if I, uh, if I, if, if we were live again, you know, and we get up out of here and we walk out of the classroom and I step on the back of Misty's shoe and I give her a flat tire, um, she, she might turn around and be like, Hey, you gave me a flat tire. And then shame would kick in because I failed to meet her expectation, which by the way, she didn't know she had that expectation be until it wasn't met. Right. And be that's because most of our expectations are actually unconscious. We're not aware that we have them until they fail to get met. So she triggers the shame response to me. I would go, Oh, geez, you know, I'm so sorry. Right. That's the guilt that says, Hey, go make it right. And uh, you know, maybe I help her put her shoe back on or something. And uh, maybe she's still rubbing her ankle. She's like, man, that really hurt. That really hurt. Holy cow. Maybe I say, Hey, Misty, you want to, you want a Dr. Pepper? Don't go to Burger King for it because they don't have any, but, but here's a Dr. Pepper. Maybe it makes your ankle feel better. Um, and then she goes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. But here's how we can get trapped in a shame, guilt treadmill. Maybe I value Misty a lot and I really value our relationship. And she goes, you know, thanks for the Dr. Pepper, you know, uh, but what I really need is a slice of pizza to go with it. And then I go, well, okay. I really value our relationship and I'm still feeling ashamed and guilty for what I did. Uh, here's a slice of pizza. Well, if the pizza doesn't do the trick and the Dr. Pepper didn't do the trick and the apology didn't do the trick, she could really string me along for quite some time, keeping me chasing this moving target all because I'm living in shame now. And as long as she keeps reminding me of how much I just hurt her ankle and how it's never going to go away. And, and I'm like, oh man, I don't, I don't know what to do. Well, that's, that's something we definitely want to avoid. And the way we avoid that is by setting good boundaries for ourselves and saying, you know what? I love you to death, Misty, but this is not how the relationship should work. Like to me, that seems like not a, not a great offense. I mean, I, I apologize about you Coke and a pizza and like, let's move on. Right. Can you extend some forgiveness and some grace? Um, a lot of people find themselves in this trap through families, through um, a big religion will do this. It's like, here's God. You're never going to hit it, but keep trying. Uh, more deeds, more deeds. Keep trying. You're never going to hit it. By the way, you're you're a sinner. <laughs> like um, anybody who's gone through any sort of big religion that can identify with that. So um, we want to be aware of this shame guilt cycle so that we can end it and move on appropriately. We don't want to eliminate shame. It's very very functional. And again, I'll I'll talk more about that in just a second. 
disgust tells us that something's not healthy for us. Um, that's the you know reaction that we get when we're around like dog poop or rotted meat or something like that. And we can also have ideological disgust, um, ideas like racism and totalitarianism. Like those are ugh, those are those are not healthy. Uh, we want to avoid those types of things. So beliefs can also trigger a disgust response if they're if they're universally unhealthy or they just they seem unhealthy to us. Surprise, like I said, lets us know we weren't prepared and it reboots the system. Excitement tells us to keep pursuing what's next. So a little tiny bit of excitement might be interest or curiosity. Um, hopefully you're all feeling that right now because Izzard's work also says that what keeps us awake, even if we're logically paying attention, is the emotion of interest. Um, so if you're still paying attention to this, thank you very much. I'm not actually checking to see if anybody has left the room, but I assume you're all listening. So then excitement keeps moving forward, keeps us moving forward. We, can, we want to keep discovering new things and learning and so forth. Happiness. Hey, you're getting what you want. Stay where you are. Don't change anything. And then finally, contempt. Contempt is one of those emotions like anger that often masks the other more vulnerable emotions. And we use this uh, adaptively, uh, so the research says, for things like defense and war. So we look when we look down upon others or we hate people or we do this us versus them thing where we compartmentalize and dehumanize people, uh, it allows us to hurt them. And it's really hard to hurt other people unless we think they're not like us. So contempt's function has a place, but I don't know that it's uh, useful for bringing people together. Uh, usually it's, like I said, in defense. Uh, if you want to go conquer somebody, you got to hurt them to conquer them usually. Uh, and so and so this is the emotion that fuels that. So let's talk about how this works. Here's the emotional wave, more of my lovely artwork. Uh, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to every emotion. And this is really important to remember. So I said it's a few seconds, right? Well, what then do we say about people who are stuck in emotion longer than a few seconds. And again, if we were in person, I'd ask for a show of hands and I'd, this would be a non-rhetorical question requiring an answer. And people would say something like, um, well, uh, it's a big giant emotion. Okay, that's that's reasonable, sure. Uh, some people might say the, emo the, the, the event keeps happening. Uh, that's fine, it can, yeah, maybe events keep happening and they stick you in this emotional, uh, you know, uh, silo, I guess. But here's what I really wanna make the point of. You yourself don't have control over whether or not you feel something. Remember back to the marker throwing analogy. If somebody throws something at you or a bee flies in your face, you, you, you blink. You don't have any control. That's the middle of this wave. So right in the center of the wave is where you lose control over whether or not you feel something. Now, we can control how much and how long we feel it by our frontal lobe, but only after we acknowledge that we're feeling it. So a lot of people end up suppressing or repressing emotion and they don't actually fully acknowledge that they felt something and they move on and, uh, and and brain chemicals get stuck and so on and so forth and i'll explain a little bit more later about that um, but just know that if you can accurately identify what you're feeling wrap your arms around it make it your own and then it's up to you how much you want to feel that and how long you want to stay in it you get to move on so for example the marker can only fly at your face once Right. And then it's done and the moment has moved on. If you're stuck in surprise, that's uh, that's up to you after some degree of time. Um, or you could reach to anger. Nobody yet has like gotten pissed at me and thrown the marker back and said, screw you. I'm out of here, Jake. I'm, I didn't come here to have markers thrown at me. Um, but the, the key is that there's a beginning, a middle and an end to every emotional experience. So they do complete. Check this out, though. Let's pretend that this is a disappointment wave. It's a sadness wave. And you see it put pacifier down there. So I have two children, uh, ages five and three. They're the, they're the most lovely children in the world, as, if you ask me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, they really are adorable. And Elijah, when he was, he's the five-year-old. When he was two, we decided the pacifier needed to go away. So um, there's, there, if any of your parents, you know that, you know, if you leave a pacifier in the mouth too long for too many years, you know, sleeping on it whatnot, it can form the, the palate and you don't want that. So, so it came time to take the pacifier. Ethan never had a pacifier, but Elijah did. So take the pacifier away from him during the day. And then eventually we took it away from, you know, during the night. And when we took it away, holy cow, like he was like, wow, 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 way longer than a few seconds. <laughs> Why? Well, he's focused on what we took away. So it's important for us as parents to allow him to push through that distress. Remember I mentioned distress tolerance in the beginning. We want to push him through this over the top of the wave so that he gets on the other side, realizes that he lost his pacifier and the world didn't spin off its axis. 
it is tolerable. This is important because the next thing that happens is going to be a bigger wave. So in life, if we can't learn to tolerate the little stuff, we're never going to tolerate the big stuff. Same three to nine seconds, bigger amplitude. Waves keep going up, up, up. And here's what it might look like. So pacifier gets taken away. Then it becomes, hey, uh, no candy before dinner time. Then it's, uh, hey, put your toys away, come in, it's dinner time. Then maybe you get a bad grade in, on a test. And then maybe your friend moves away. And then maybe uh, the girl you have a crush on doesn't like you back. And then maybe the girl you're dating dumps you for the third string tight end on the football team, hypothetically speaking. Um, and then maybe you don't get into the college that you want. And then your dog dies, your grandma dies. Uh, bigger amplitude, same few seconds. Grandma can only die once. Why do we grieve? We're remembering grandma. We're still sad about what we lost. But the event itself only happens once. Take a moment here and talk about trauma. These are all developmental curves too. As we go through life, we're supposed to experience things in relation to our own developmental stages. Now, what happens if the five-year-old watches his dog get hit by a car in the middle of the road? That is horrible. But it's also a wave that's like way up on top of the curve and it outstrips his developmental status at that point. There's lots of ways to describe trauma and I'm not negating any of them. This one for me works pretty well because people seem to understand it. What you're doing is you're introducing an experience in life that the brain simply isn't prepared for. That's, that's the emotional functioning of trauma as far as I'm concerned. It's really easy to teach that because people seem to understand it. So even for an adult, that's really hard. Well, what do we do with adults who deal with trauma on a daily basis? We train them for it. We slowly expose them to things. We get them used to the ideas like in clinical land, we talk about suicidal ideation. We talk about death. We talk about uh, violence and neglect and abuse and all these horrible things that people do. And then we go out and experience it. And the first time is very shocking and we have to call CPS or something like that. Uh, and then it gets a little bit easier if we learn to process and be like, wow, that was horrible but it's somebody else's horror, not mine. I don't have to bring it home with me. So we learned some distress tolerance. We learned some good boundaries. Um, but if you're not prepared for that, you could inadvertently expose yourself to trauma. We learned through 9-11, our field professionally uh, decided that long ago, you couldn't have trauma unless it happened directly to you. Well, 9-11 occurred and the whole country was traumatized and everybody's like, what the heck is this? Well, come to find out there is such a thing as vicarious trauma. If you repeatedly expose yourself to something that's horrific over and over and over and over again, especially if you're not well developed for it or well trained for it, or it's done and it's not done in a good environment, like say a police academy, I teach the police academy too, uh, or the fire academy or, or uh, medical school or something like that, then what ends up happening is you get, you get shocked. The brain kind of gets seared, if you will. And now think about social media. What are we doing with social media other than exposing ourselves over and over and over and over and over again to ugliness and horror? Uh, we want to be mindful of what we intake into our brains because it can have a lasting effect, especially if we're not preparing ourselves. So uh, interesting side note, the book that we use, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is the DSM. It says specifically <laughs> that unless it's in the line of duty, you can't have PTSD from repeated exposure to images. I, I don't know what sense that makes. So apparently a detective studying a crime scene can have PTSD from watching like pictures of the crime scene. But the the 14 year old who's doom scrolling Twitter and seeing horrific images of like dead bodies in Darfur or something can't be traumatized. It doesn't, it, it makes no sense to me. Uh, but I didn't write the book. I am just supposed to use it. But just please know that in my experience and in most people's experiences, if you if you get an, a life event that outstrips your developmental ability, you're going to have some trauma effect. Keep COVID in the back of your head. So there's the three to nine seconds. There's the middle of the wave. The middle of the wave is important because here's what happens. We want to go up the wave and we want to go down the wave. But if we bail out, if we just go and then say in childhood, somebody goes, hey, Jake, boys don't cry. I don't want to hear about your bullying at school. Uh, tough noogies. You can't win them all on the football team. Uh, pull up your bootstraps, turn off the tears, uh, 
you know, suffer in silence, all those things. Dudes tend to have a worse time at this than, than girls do. But um, we can really get what's called emotionally invalidated. And that trains us almost like we train cops and emergency responders and medicine people. We, we inadvertently train our children to avoid the emotional distress of having to lose control and then eventually push through and go to the other side. So in the end, we just shut it down altogether and our brain never actually gets the experience of pushing through so that then we can't tolerate the next experience. This is very dangerous. We don't want to bail out of the way. What we want to do is push through the center and move on because life does go on and there will be other moments and we want to experience those moments. And if we practiced avoidance for too long, uh, we disengage from life. Here's the human connection. I meant that I mentioned that this is really important for us to, to be able to interconnect with one another. So there's there's an anthropological theory that uh, suggest there's several of them actually. They all kind of say the same thing, but there's several of them that suggest that Homo sapiens evolved because our species, as opposed to some of the other hominids, um, we have a bigger limbic brain. Some of those other ones, Australopithecus and uh, I can't speak, Australopithecus and Neanderthal, and they had bigger frontal lobes. So, in examining the skulls left behind, we think that they were smarter. They could develop tools and whatnot. They also lived independently. Well, we Homo sapiens, we weren't as smart, but we did have an emotional brain that was a little larger, and that's what helped us connect. So, here's what else Izzard found out from his research. Somewhere between 88 and 94% accuracy, we can identify one of those 10 emotions by the facial expression somebody's wearing. Why is that important? Well, we were, and here goes the anthropological theory. We were connected in community. We held, we held together in tribes. We were able to better withstand things like climate change and predator attacks and that kind of thing, whereas some of the other ones got picked off and, and they died. So go back to the shame. What's shame's function? to tell us that we failed to meet some of these expectations. If my job in the tribe is to hunt down food and bring it back, and I don't do that, the tribe's going to let me know. I mean, Jake, we're going to starve. I, I need to make that right by going and getting food because otherwise I could get kicked out of my tribe. And if I get kicked out of my tribe, I die. So emotional relatedness is how we connect with people, not through experiences. We can, we can all experience the same ball game and have very different emotions about it. We come together in tribes, we connect through facial expression. So if you've blunted yourself, you've practiced a lot of emotional avoidance, and you just like have a flat face and you go, oh, I don't care, whatever, my grandma died, it doesn't affect me, life goes on, ha, ha, ha. I get a mixed signal from that because you're telling me something very sad, but your face is saying it's fine or that you don't care. And then I don't necessarily want to connect with you. So human connectivity is very important. Intimacy drives this relationship. If you can ride through the wave and you can know that you can lose control at that peak and make it, then you're more likely to build intimacy with others because you practice vulnerability. If you can practice being vulnerable, you can open up and people can connect. However, vulnerability comes with risk. Risk of what? Pain. Somebody could violate that for you, right? They could invalidate you. They could reject you and that hurts. So it's, we're really averse to vulnerability. Great lecture, but why are you here? Okay, we wanna prevent impairment. We wanna know our emotions. We wanna claim them, communicate them, tolerate them. You don't need to go diving into a bottle. Um, I mentioned that if you avoid things, you you avoid you know human connectivity as well. Really what you avoid is your own life. So the way I teach anxiety and depression is anxiety is when we fixate our thoughts on something in the future that hasn't happened yet. And we're worried about it. We're concerned. It's usually rooted in fear, but fixate my thoughts in the future. Then I have some anxious distress about that because I can't do anything about it. It's not here. Conversely, depression, which is apparently to my left and anxiety is to my right. Uh, depression is when I fixate my thoughts on the past and, that, and things I can't do anything about now because they're, they're gone. They're over. The antidote is living in the present, but living in the present means that we have to tolerate the life and all the environmental stimulus that it throws at us, which can push us into discomfort. And if we don't know how to tolerate discomfort because we've practiced avoidance, we're not going to be able to do it. We want to be in the present. And this isn't to invite everybody to be all like hippie and be like, whatever happens, happens, man. I don't care about the future. I don't care about the past. No, no, no. We want to be mindfully reflecting on our past 
to evaluate our failures and learn from them and learn from our successes and repeat them. We want to anticipate the future and plan for retirement and, and all that sort of stuff. We don't want to live in either because we're living in either. We're missing now. And if we miss now, we've got even more reason to be upset because we've missed life and it creates a stacking effect. So we want to engage fully and then we don't have to avoid I get that it's scary. I get that it's tough. And then of course, no dying, um, suicide prevention and intervention. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, I'll get to this in a second. We're going to talk about a little bit about COVID. we got this pandemic going on. And now that I've given you the neurological overview, uh, what's happening is our brains are, are wired to respond to the environment and then deal with the thing and then move on in a crisis. What we typically do is, is our brains will, Notice that there's crisis and we'll, we'll step fully into logic and suppress the limbic to handle the crisis and move forward. Well, now we've got this sort of crisis and perpetuity thing where everybody's constantly on edge and that's not how we're designed. So we're having this, we're seeing this like very strong negative effect on everybody because we're literally overloaded with brain chemicals telling us that we need to be on alert and we're wearing out. And it's causing physiological problems too, because at a cellular level, if we can't process through the brain chemicals, the cortisol, the, the adrenaline, the epinephrine, the norepinephrine, all that stuff that's telling us to do stuff, and it's constantly pumping because we're, again, doom scrolling Twitter and looking at headlines and seeing testimonies of horrible stories in the hospital, people dying, and oh my God, when do we get a break? When's the resolution? So somewhere along the way, we have to learn to deal with this. And that's in about two slides. So watch your language. Saying I feel is ruining your ability to think. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. If you want to learn more about it, you can watch my YouTube video. It's literally titled saying I feel is ruining your ability to think. Um, and that's because beliefs and uh, our, our thoughts and feelings and emotions are separate. So if I say I feel like this room's the wrong color, that's actually not a feeling. It's not one of those 10. It's, it's an interpretation. It's, a, it's an appearance. It's something that I'm thinking about. I can change my thoughts. I can change my mind. Can't necessarily change what I feel. So instead of saying, I feel like you're not listening to me, which I can't even tell because I'm staring at the screen and into a camera and I, don't even, I can't even see faces. It's very bizarre to me. Um, instead of saying, I feel like, try, it seems, seems to be, or it appears to be, or I get the idea or something along those lines. That way you end up holding your beliefs a little bit looser. Because if you say, I feel, it kind of locks you down and you're not able to do anything about it. I say coping skills are stupid, but not really, but they don't solve the problem. They treat the symptom. So this is something else you can ask, you know, are you, are you treating the problem? Like what got you to what you're experiencing? Or are you just treating the experience? Are you treating the anxiety? Are you treating the, the root cause of the anxiety? Here's the big V. Validate. Validate literally means to make good. And what you want to do with your emotions is acknowledge them and allow yourself space to be like, this is happening to me right now. I am scared. I'm on my heels. The more you can do this with your subordinates, with your employees, if you're in HR and you're interested in how to do this, um, I can certainly do it more. I'm trying to blow through this presentation, leave Missy some time. Um, but what you do is you can validate the feeling because feelings are universal. For 40,000 years, all human beings have had the same 10 emotions and they do the same thing in everybody's brain. You can validate with as much precision as possible that feeling without condoning the reason that got to it. So we're, we're in the middle of a political chaotic storm too right now, right? And we got like all these sides and they're fighting. And you can say like, God, you know, if I were you, that would, I would totally feel that way too. Because if I were you, I would feel that way. It's not like through my eyes or my metaphorical mile in the shoes or whatever. It's if I were you, I would feel the same way. We can validate that. But like, yeah, man, that seems scary yeah, we're all really keyed up right now, aren't we? Yeah. And what that does is it takes the limbic system, which is flaring. And it's, if you can validate the emotion, it calms it down. Instead of having a non-working prefrontal cortex, we end up with this non-working amygdala and limbic system and a working prefrontal cortex. And then we can introduce some options. Here's the yield theory. This is, uh, my friend Christian Conti talks about this in his book, and I'll get that in one slide. Listen, validate, explore options. You got to listen first. We got to validate second, and then we can explore options. A lot of people get this inverted, especially if you're managing employees and they're distressed. And you're like, just, just do this. They don't want to hear just do this. That's number three. That's exploring options. What you got to do is pause, be patient, validate what they're feeling. And then once they're re-regulated and their limbic system return or their logic returns, then you can present options. 
here's the book. It's called Walking Through Anger. It's basically his life's work of yield theory. If you want to pick that up, it's like 15 bucks on Amazon. It's a very, very useful tool. Um, anybody in any profession can use it. Uh, it's focused on anger because Christian's uh, history is as an anger management expert, but it's really about yield theory. And then finally, I want to offer another resource. Walk the Talk America is a group upon whose board I sit as the mental health guy. What we're trying to do is pull together the cultures of mental health and firearms ownership so that we stop blame shifting. But here's the real key. Those wristbands that you saw in that picture have this on it. It says, for free and, take a free and anonymous mental health screening today. I'm wearing mine right here. If you go to WTTA.org slash love, you get to take one of those. There's like 14 screenings. Two of them are in Spanish, I believe. New 13 screenings. Uh, the anxiety and depression are in Spanish. They're super quick. Sit down, take a screening. It spits out a number. It says you got mild anxiety, medium anxiety, severe anxiety, whatever. And then at least it gives a little bit of insight to the person who's taking it to go, hmm, maybe I need to get this checked out. Or, oh, no, this is just normal. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Please, please, please push these screenings out. They're powered by Mental Health America. I mentioned before, does the, the ranking the states thing. They're, uh, they're evidence-based. They're, they have great fidelity. WTTA.org slash love. Take free and anonymous mental health screening. Nobody knows it but you. Uh, or your employer, whoever's taking it. And then finally, I want to offer the National Crisis Line, 800-273-TALK. That's what T-A-L-K spell, or A-255 spells TALK. Or you can text to 741741. And that's all I got. Uh, I have a podcast called Noggin Notes. We also have a Guns and Mental Health podcast. I think it's really good shit because I'm the one hosting it. Sorry, I probably shouldn't swear, but <laughs> that's just me. So I'm going to stop my screen sharing and hopefully, Misty, I didn't take too much time. No, oh, thank you so much. And and I'll I'll just say right now, I know that uh, you know the scheduled ending of the call is 1 p.m. But uh, Jake and Misty, if you're both uh, okay to hang out for a little bit longer, we'll uh, make sure to take uh, take our time with you, Misty, and make sure to get to Q and A. And just a quick note, if there are people who have to hop off the call, it's being recorded. Uh, so you'll be able to, I'll send out the link uh, this afternoon after the call is done. You'll be able to rewatch at your leisure uh, and, and continue to digest these concepts. Uh, so if you have to hop off, no worries. Um, you can always just uh, reach out to one of us individually with any questions, or you can uh, watch on your own time. So with that, uh, Misty, go for it. Great. Thanks, Jake. Great to follow you. I'm going to skip through these first few slides rather quickly because I think the important part is what to look for and how to help someone over the holidays. But currently, Nevada is eighth, eighth highest in the nation. When I started this work, we, we were the highest suicide rate in the nation. And as Jake mentioned, 51st in mental health, public health, spending. Um, so what we need to be doing in Nevada is just grassroots help. These conversations, empowering yourself, to do the work because we all have a role to play when it comes to preventing suicide. We know our friends, our colleagues, our loved ones. And when, when you're having that trauma and multiple traumas, uh, this is a real possibility, mental health crises, substance use, and suicide. I will state it is the leading cause of death for our young people in Nevada, not just Nevada, but other states. And it's going up for people nationwide and our young people. I think typically, as Jake went into the depression and anxiety, typically about one in five um, youth has had thoughts of suicide, seriously considered suicide. I think it's now one in four, 25% um, through COVID. So, and I don't see that changing. Nevada is on the path to having the highest increase in suicide rates. Now I'm gonna say on the path because it's hit our unemployment, um, our financial economic forecast looks pretty dark, but we don't have to be that state. If we can get ahead of this and make sure we're watching out for each other and utilizing the resources, it doesn't have to be. Suicide is almost always preventable, and I can't say that enough. So some of the, the signs we want to look for, often you hear, you know, they had a mental health issue. The reason they took their life is because they had mental health concerns. 54% of those who took their life had a prior reported mental health concern. Now, when we say reported, it's because of that stigma and taboo. So it might still be there and we just don't know it, but not necessarily. I think this has been in such a bucket of mental health for so long. Look at these issues on the slide. It's those day-to-day -day life events, the day-to-day -day stressors, environment. We could recognize that someone's ill, get them to an acute care facility for inpatient treatment, 
But if we send them right back to the same environment or the toxic relationship, they're going to get, their risk is going to increase again. And relationship problems is the number one triggering event. That could be bullying at school. It could be a divorce or a breakup, parent to child often we see. So, so pay attention to the life events. Um, substance use is going up. We need to pay attention to that because of isolation, self-medication, and all the stressors we're seeing right now, housing and economic challenges are a big part as well. So you can have both, those risk factors of the life events and traumas, plus the day-to-day -day stressors. I want to put this in there. You guys will be getting these slides, but these are the, the comprehensive strategies we as a community need to put forth to improve our mental well-being and reduce suicide. That's why I say everyone has a role to play, and I really appreciate Christine giving me the opportunity and Anne always giving me the opportunity to speak to community members who are out there in the business um, field and in the human services. Economic supports we can work on changing. Housing is huge right now. It's just um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If we have our basic needs and our safety and security met, that really helps us cope with the challenges. I'm not going to say it takes away the challenges, but we cope better. Um, so we want to create those protective environments, reducing access to lethal means. I'm so grateful to work with Jake on that Walk to Talk America with mental health. Uh, we recently had an increase in youth suicide rates because they are isolated on virtual education. They're away from the support systems and no eyes on them. And firearms are about 70% of the means used for youth suicide. We can prevent that by locking our guns up or of getting them out of the home or you know, changing the codes multiple times, our medications as well, but I, I wanna focus on firearms because 70% um, and we can reduce that. Connectedness, huge. Jake mentioned this as well, we need to be connected. Now, I like to talk about connectedness in a, in a bigger vision, not just humans. Um, I'm an introvert, so I, I like the mountains and my cats. Um, but it could be connected to a higher power, connected to your school, connected to your community, connected to yourself. Really having that self-love can go a long way in, again, helping you cope and balance with life stressors. Teaching coping skills is huge, starting very early on how to communicate, um, ask for help, seek help, listen and validate really important so that when we have that relationship breakup it doesn't tip us over into complete crisis and then we want to have postvention and um, intervention postvention is after a death by suicide or after a suicide attempt how do we come in and support that family who's in bereavement or especially after ideation or an attempt how do we support that family in keeping their loved ones safe and in recovery because recovery from suicide ideation or attempts is incredibly possible. With the right help and support, we can keep them safe, often for a lifetime. So here during COVID, what COVID has taught us as a state, we had, we had these challenges to begin with, but it's like pouring gasoline on a fire, right? All of the cracks in our support system and in our disparities with health and culturally rise and become explosive with fire. So we already had an issue with elder suicide. A big part of that is isolation and loneliness. Well, now look what we're dealing with. Even the holidays where they might see family, it's recommended not to have it. Our kids who need their support system are now behind a screen. And while social media and technology are something they're very used to, um, it doesn't protect them most of the time when they are feeling that depression and anxiety. Escalating stress, this is a, it's a long haul. And we are heightened, as Jake mentioned, we're exhausted. I, yesterday, just, I was spiraling out of control myself because I had friends who were dealing with COVID diagnoses in their own families, and then the fire starts, and they're worried about neighbors. Um, how much can one human bear with all of these competing stressors going on? And then that increased access to the firearms. You add the alcohol, the anxiety, the uncertainty, and a firearm, and it's a lethal, lethal combination. These are some of the things, uh, when someone ends their life, most of the time it's not about wanting to die. In fact, almost 100% of the time, it's not about dying. It's about escaping pain, overwhelming pain from loss, from um, 
feeling like a burden on your loved one. That to me is one of the biggest things. When, when we feel like our family would be better off without us, I'm really concerned that that person's at the peak of their crisis. Um, the sudden mood changes, such as they've been depressed for weeks or months and all of a sudden they're feeling better. They're feeling better because they're, they're finding an answer, a relief from that pain. And so pay attention to that. If you notice that shift, walk up and say, I am so glad you're feeling better. What's changed for you? It could be therapy. It could be the weather. The smoke went away. Or they think suicide is going to be the end of their pain. So these are all signs you might see. And the easiest way I can tell you um, day to day, and especially going into the holidays, any change in that colleague, your staff member, a family member, any change in mood, appearance, or behavior is worth reaching out and asking. I'm worried about you. How are you doing? So maybe typically they are really put together well, and all of a sudden, you know, the hygiene's gone down, the hair, you know, COVID hair, Zoom hair, we, we, we're all a little challenged right now with that. But, but maybe you notice on Zoom, they're, they're not turning their camera on anymore. You used to always see them, and you can't connect. Reach out by chat. Ask them what's going on. Christine just turned her camera on. <laughs> yeah. Um, these subtle little things that, you know, you're, you're used to, to going out to lunch or something like that, check in with them. If, uh, if they're drinking more, beginning or increasing in substance use, we need to pay attention to that. If they are giving away things or they're, they're not working um, or they're overworking, sleeping little or sleeping a lot, any change, check it out. What protects us from all of these things? Uh, effective mental health care, and I will say overall health care. We have to have access to that. One of the side effects of COVID that I think is a positive is we have impacted our stigma quite a bit. We know every single person is impacted in one way or another by anxiety, depression, sadness, um, just worry from one day to the next. And so we're talking about it more. We're reaching out more and having these difficult conversations. And we are learning through, through the Zoom module that we can get telehealth. So people that might not have been able to get access to healthcare. I had a physical health appointment with my doctor and it was wonderful. I loved it. So those who have transportation issues, maybe childcare issues, or maybe other things that they don't want to leave the house for, they now can get help. And um, I think that's been a real bonus for people. The challenge is more people are wanting help and we still, you know, the workforce is still not what we need it to be nationwide, but especially in Nevada. Connecting this always. So as many connections as you can help that person build, do it. So if you see them lacking in that connection to the earth, you know, maybe get them out gardening or walking. Um, faith absolutely can be incredibly protective for people. So maybe they need to reconnect with that faith background. Um, family. So if they're feeling isolated or if they're feeling like a burden on their family, how do we have that discussion? Your family would not want you to die. What do we need to do to help you not feel like a burden? Kids and elders often have that burn from this at the time of crisis. And you notice how I put lethal means under almost every slide. <laughs> it, it is crucial. It, it is one of the few proven prevention strategies. Get those medications out of the house or locked up firearms. Um, we talked about this a lot, and we were reducing our firearm suicide rate from about 67% down to national average of 51%. But then things started happening, and we weren't able to have those conversations with our gun shops. We weren't able to go to the gun shows, and now it's back up to about 64%. That's huge. So back to COVID and coping, we, we definitely, Jake mentioned this a lot, Stay off social media. I've been off social media for about a year and it's the best thing I could have done for my own mental health. I do not miss it. I apologize, the phone always rings when I'm presenting. Um, make time to unwind, really set that option to take a breath. Meditate is so important just to kind of reset your brain. And, and Jake mentioned this too, that keeping you in the here and now. We can't control our past and the traumas. We, we have so much uncertainty in the future but if we stay grounded and focused in the present, it goes a long, long way of reducing that anxiety. Um, and focus on the facts, connect with others. There's a program out there called Home Means Nevada. I absolutely love, I wish we had thought of that name, darn it. But it's got some great things called Ask Five. Reach out to five people every day in your life and just check on them. How are you? I haven't talked to you in a while. I had someone from Germany check on me. 
at the beginning of COVID that I hadn't talked to in years, um, a great opportunity. And I would say escalate that up to ask 10 over the holidays. We, we, when Jake and I were preparing this, you know, there's, there's this belief out there that suicide rates go up in the holidays. That is a myth. Depression, absolutely. Anxiety, overwhelm, for sure. Um, I think it was you, Christine, who said holidays. <laughs> we're in a daze. We have too much coming on our plate. And I think in the next few weeks, we're all going to miss that because um, we are, we're used to it. So keep checking on people. Have a meal together by Zoom. One meal is not worth our health. I, I really believe I'm telling my own mom, we can't do this. Um, it's just not worth the risk. But it doesn't mean we, we have to stay isolated. So share your connectedness, share your joy. And then Forever 14 is a local organization who also has incredibly positive messages for young people. So Home Means Nevada does have a website and they have videos, um, testimonials from people who recover. They get through the hard times and I think those are the messages we need to share with everyone. We can get through this. Uh, I think I'm probably close to running out of time, so we're going to breeze through. Um, there are self-care kits, so maybe check out your stress levels and then seek out that help where, where you're having the gaps. And the website's down there. You will get this again, I mentioned. Lethal means in Spanish and English, you know, the medications, the firearms. We have gun locks and medication safes if anyone needs one. If you know a family who's going through this, just contact me or contact Christine, and we'll make sure to get something in your hands. We just got CARES funding for suicide prevention because of the uptick we're seeing, and it let us purchase hundreds of safes and gun locks. So we have to have those in families' hands by the end of the year, December 31st. You know, a blessing and a curse, but um, we want to make sure we get these tools in families' hands, not in our storage units. Jake already shared that with you. It's 24-7, you guys. If you press 1 after calling that number, you get the Veterans Crisis Line. They are incredibly skilled responders who are um, well-versed in PTS, post-traumatic stress, military culture, traumatic brain injury, and that veteran can get directly linked into the local VA for help if that's a crisis. Great resources for you. These are some of the other hotlines. I will tell you, we have mobile crisis for our youth under 18. They come out with a case manager and a, a licensed counselor to assess the goal is to keep families out of the hospital. Most people with thoughts of suicide do not leave, need that level of acute care. And it can be traumatizing in the best of circumstances. Add COVID to that. We, we want to get them the help they need without going to that emergency department. So they'll come to the school, the home. They'll meet you anywhere to assess. And telemedicine especially right now. So you could get that assessment for your young person through telemedicine. So that number is under mobile crisis. Renal behavioral health when we started COVID, um, volunteered to be that direct line for care now. They don't have to go to the hospital. You can go straight to renal behavioral health for that um, care, again, for COVID protection. We had to wonder what, what's more dangerous, the thoughts of suicide or COVID? And so this was a great answer to that. And let me see if there's any others. Crisis text is a wonderful 741741. If you want to give back, you can do training with the crisis text line over the internet. I think it's about 30 hours, and you can be a text responder right here in your own home. So if that's something you're looking for, also the hotline is having constant training if you prefer that. But it's very rewarding. As I mentioned before, that changed my life. When I worked at the hotline, I never wanted to go back, and I, I, I still don't. I love this work. Um, for COVID, additional resources was um, the Nevada Resilience Project. We got through COVID care funds as well. So 211 or Nevada Resilience Project has toolkits to empower your kids and families. Um, they have crisis counselors called um, resilience ambassadors who are there to help you with resources, get you through the disaster, or even if it's a crisis. We've been training them for suicide crisis because they're seeing a lot of that as well. So great resources to share with your staff members. There's a NAMI warm line, so you don't necessarily have to be in crisis, but you could be lonely or have mental health challenges. That's a great hotline. And then Foundation for Recovery. If, if people are struggling with their substance use recovery, opioid use recovery, um, they have tele, telegroup as well, I believe. So make sure you share these resources with your staff as we're going into the holidays, but, but not just because of the holidays, but every day. 
trainings. We mandate trainings right now for majority of healthcare providers. So we are constantly updating our training options. The three at the bottom are online courses that counseling on access to lethal means is excellent. Um, if you're healthcare providers, great resources for them as well. And then if you go to the Nevada Office of Suicide Prevention, we have multiple trainings going on right now. We're trying to train all of the state employees um, with our gatekeeper. So it's, it's a huge push. Everyone is seeing that need. Healthcare providers, first responders, this was created at the beginning of COVID too because we were worried about their burnout and mental wellness. So they aren't getting many calls on this line. It's, um, it's physicians down at UNLV School of Medicine. We wanted the culture you know, physicians helping healthcare providers, but um, share that if you know any healthcare providers, nurses, doctors, responders that, that need help themselves. It's confidential and free. These are websites that are great. And I've, if you haven't seen this, please check this out. It's that video put on by our arts community in Reno. And oh my gosh, even thinking about it brings tears to my eyes. It, it's full of hope. And I think after this presentation, go listen to it and reshift back into your work day, but it is just wonderful. And it does keep me believing in hope. And that's our contact information. So as I mentioned, don't hesitate um, today or as you're moving forward in COVID, in the holidays, or just forever, know that we're here to help you. If you have a question about something or you're worried about someone, we're here to help. And I know Jake, Jake would um, be there as well for you. And now let's see if I can figure out how to get out of here and stop sharing my screen. And I think we'll open it to any questions, Christine. Yes, absolutely. Thank you both so much. It's, I mean, it's immediately clear that we needed about, you know, 24 more hours to, to devote to these topics, which is understandable, but it's still, it's still so helpful to have any dialogue as opposed to no dialogue. So thank you both so much once again. Um, just to launch really quickly into questions. And again, if you have to hop off, that's totally fine. You'll receive the YouTube link later today, as well as all of the class materials in case you are feverishly trying to take notes. Those are coming your way soon. Um, let's see. I guess first I'll ask uh, Jake or Misty, did you receive any questions uh, during your presentations privately that you wanted to address? I did not. Okay. I did not. All right. Um, there is one one question that that I received, uh, an anonymous question, and it's a good one. Uh, it's it's it, it's in relation to how to talk to your employer, your coworkers uh, about any anxiety that you're experiencing. How do you tell your boss you're experiencing anxiety in a way that won't show signs of weakness or incompetence? I'm in an organization where rising above current challenges is rewarded and you feel left behind or alienated by the professionals surrounding you. Uh, I, I'm assuming if you don't meet that expectation. Um, what, what kinds of advice would you have for having, having emotional dialogue with, with your boss um, or with uh, someone else that you're working with? Um. That's tough because that one sounds like a cultural question. And um, if, if the culture is such that it's not inviting that type of dialogue, I don't know what I would do. But I have been in cultures in I've been in work cultures that are similar to that, where uh, discussing certain certain things are just not it's not it's not welcome. But my my feedback would be to make it intentional, make it purposeful, set an actual appointment with the boss on the calendar so it's not a passing hallway conversation sit down go in prepared and frame it in the the context of this is impacting work productivity that usually gets people's attention i'm not as productive because of whatever's going on in my life it could be death in the family it could be uh, my cat's got leukemia it could be COVID. right it doesn't matter what matters is the outcome and so if if you say hey hey boss um, I'm experiencing these things. It's impacting these areas. Here's what I've, here's what I've seen from my colleagues, my coworkers, um, without throwing people under the bus, right? Like I really, really want to be a high achiever here. It's very clearly important to the company and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm having a tough time getting through this and then offer a solution. Don't just dump it in the boss's lap and be like, you solved it for me. Say, I think what, what would help a great deal is, and then come with your solutions. I, I think that's probably the best way to address it. Address it on the terms that of the person you're you're seeking to appeal to, 
um, rather than just like kind of whining in the wind, not suggesting anybody does that. But sometimes it can be really intimidating trying to take on a system that is resistant to, to receiving that feedback. And, and as a side note, I would just say my at the end of my career, if I'm in my rocking chair on my front porch, you know, sipping a homebrew, I would really expect that we talk as cleanly and fluently about mental wellness as we do physical wellness. Nobody has a problem posting a, a CrossFit video on their Facebook account, but for some reason we can't talk about our depression or anxiety. You know what I mean? So I would love for people to be snapping selfies and posting them on Instagram of sitting in the Zephyr wellness lobby. you like, get my anxiety treatment on, you know, and that would be great. We're not there yet. Right. Um, Misty, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think COVID, Jake, is, is giving us that opportunity because we can assume everyone's feeling anxiety at, at the minimum, anxiety, um, which often is linked to the depression. I agree with Jake, but I would add possibly, um, I know this probably isn't an option, but if you're in a, a work environment that does not allow you to be, take self-care, um, I've seen people get to that risk of suicide because of that, because they didn't want to lose their job. No job is worth your life for. So I know that might not be timing right now, but I, I maybe approach your boss with burnout. Everyone experiences burnout and it's a little more tolerable as a concept. Um, it, it's absolutely linked, but it might have less judgment upon you as the person reaching out and just say, you know, I, I am exhausted and I know my productivity is down. Um, I need a couple of days to regain my balance and I want to come back stronger, but I, I'm just a little tapped out right now. So that might be another angle as well. Great, thank you. And and I know, I mean, Jake, you mentioned this uh, at at the at the start of your response that you know a lot of it does in this particular case it does sound like a culture issue. Um, so I, I think my my follow up question to that question um, is for anyone whether they are what whether they would consider themselves an employer or an employee. How do you cultivate a culture or what are some ways you can cultivate a culture uh, in the workspace that allows for this emotional dialogue where perhaps there's not a fear or a stigma around using emotional language? I think we have to lead by example. And um, it, if you're an employee, there's some risk to leading if you're not asked to lead. If you're an employer, you don't have a choice. You, you must lead. And um, the best way to do it is to be authentic and consistent. Uh, transparency helps a great deal, but certainly authenticity and consistency help. So the reason I taught the emotions is for that reason. If we don't know what we're feeling, we don't have words to put to them. And I have a, I have a sheet that I can send you, you can disseminate. It's got the definitions on one side and then some synonyms on the back. Uh, and we use imprecise language, or we just kind of poo poo it to the side, then we don't create that culture. There's another psychological component in here called non attachment and non attachment does not mean being detached non attachment means being very passionate about something and simultaneously holding it loosely. So you can introduce a culture and and your non attachment to people's presentations, their experiences, their complaints, whatever it is be like, hey, that's awesome. I totally hear you. I validate that and not simultaneously wear it or take it on or think that it's silly or whatever. I think creating a culture of non-attachment and warmth and love while precisely labeling what the emotional experiences are can, can create that, but one has to do it oneself. If you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to be able to do it. It's just like parenting, you know? So um, if you're an employer or a boss manager, I would encourage you to start striving that direction find out who you are first, bring that in its fullness. And then people will follow because they'll be like, oh, it's cool to talk like that in this, in this workplace. And it works the other way too. If it's, if it's cool to talk, down to people, well, they're going to follow that too. So we want to be striving for, for authenticity and genuineness, connectivity, consistency, that kind of thing. And the only thing I would add, Jake already talked about and validate, if you are an employer and you're noticing things, really listening can make a world of difference. Um, I know in crisis, we don't have to call 911 on people or send them in hospital because if we listen, often they're working it through themselves and they're de-escalating and then they realize their coping strategies. So validate Validate, validate. I'm so glad you brought that up because that was my other question. Um, I think the, the validation really stood out to me as a keystone, especially as we're relating to people in a work setting, you know, validating people's concerns, validating people's needs, validating 
uh, people's uh, emotional experiences. What are some ways in as as we're having dialogue with our fellow our fellow coworkers? What are what are some ways or even some language, some recommended language? I mean, we don't want to sound robotic, but what is some recommended language? Um, uh, you know, in in hopes of being precise, uh, some recommended language that we can use to to validate our coworkers' experiences. Um, this one's a lot shorter. So the, the the real root of yield theory is meet people where they are, and in order to do that, you got to get out of your own way first, and you got to kind of sort of predict where they are. You can't meet them where they used to be. You can't meet them where you want them to be, or that they could be Sunday, right where they are. And the, the phrase I find very, very useful, and you got to be authentic in this and you got to mean it is, I hear you, but you got to damn well hear them. <laughs> you got to listen. And then you go, I hear you. That's it. And then being able to sit in somebody's distress is very challenging too. If you can sit in somebody else's distress and help them through it, you're really, you're really meeting them where they are. Yeah, I think that's so important, Jake. That's, you can't fix these things. You don't have to fix it. What is most important is that you're by their side and listening. And I will, I will add, you can assume right now that people are having trouble. So you could either by, by letter, however you're communicating with your staff, video call, just put it out there. You know, I know we're all going through stressful times and I wanted to offer an opportunity to talk about it. Or um, I, if not that, but there's also a list of resources and hotlines and people you can call. So just, get it out there ahead of them and that gives them permission to be authentic themselves and share they will trust you but again it's like you have to listen you have to be true if you're going to throw that out there you can't just throw it out there and then shut down when they need your help make, make the invitation make the invitation and then and then hold that space right i'm not a big fan of mandates i'm not a big fan of top-down authoritarian direction i'm a big fan of honoring people's autonomy and just inviting them in. If they don't want to walk through, that's fine. But if they do be there for them, right? So make the invitation. That's a good, great job, Misty. Thank you for saying that. Right. Absolutely. And I, I definitely know there've been points in my life, uh, whether, whether as a coworker, or as a supervisor, where, you know, I've said, I hear you. And there have been times I've meant it. And there have been times that I haven't. And so, you know, I grieve the times I haven't, but I, I definitely, I carry the mantle of, of responsibility as we all should uh, in, in meaning what we say and, and taking the time to say what we mean. Um, so thank you both for, for those responses. Um, I, I have, of course, I have a mountain of questions I could keep asking you all day, but I would rather toss it out to anyone who is left on the call to see if there are any final, final thoughts or questions from the audience. Yeah, I'm not going there anywhere. I can do this the rest of the afternoon. We got plenty of bodies out here doing the SOS stuff. So, can you hear me? Oh, is Anne? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I never get tired of hearing from Misty. You're always such an exceptional presenter. Thank you, and we always have you back for our annual leadership class. And I'm touched by your commentary today. And Jake, I was mesmerized rapidly taking notes. I'm one of these people, if I write it down, I'm going to remember it and feel it. And you were so articulate in terms of the discrete emotions and our, our responses to them and, and ways in which we can learn to be more adaptive. I'm certainly feeling the experience of age and my ability to be a little bit more resilient, having been in the North Tower on 9-11, going through a very long the, the ugly divorce, you, you're you weathered. Uh, you're like a, a piece of wood that gets smoother in time. And I'm not suggesting that I don't feel sad or lonely or depressed or anger, angry or, or fearsome about things, but I do think the test of time uh, is something we should think about. I also wanted to just mention, I had a, a Hawaiian grandmother who, when I was going through my divorce, used your analogy of the wave and um, it was better than any medication or therapy I, I could have gone through. She said, um, think of a very large wave. You're standing in shallow water and a very, very large wave is coming towards you. What you should do is dive, dive right through the deepest, scariest part, and you will come up on the other side and see sunshine. And I've always thought about that. Uh, I, I literally picture that in times of stress or sadness. I think this too shall pass. Um, I think your your conversation about 
experiencing the full raw emotion of something is so significant. We avoid it. We find ways to repress it. We discourage it at work. Um, you know, having been uh, uh, in a leadership position, when I was um, growing in my professional career to um, repress those emotions and often being the only female, it was assumed that if I was sad or I was tearful, that was because I was a woman rather than just being a feeling, caring person. So I, I think we all have a lot of work to do, both as leaders and influencers and peers and family members and, and friends, which is to give a, an authentic voice there should be as many videos and memes about uh, our, our authentic emotions as there should be about our new muscles or new shoes or whatever it may be. We're living in a time of great distress and I, I'm so appreciative of the small team I have who I hope feel that they can share that announce that with a measure of pride because I value people who are authentic and I would hope the other individuals and in supervisory capacities on this call would do the same, would allow the, the range of emotions to take place, um, not to repress them or in, to en encourage an author authoritarian disciplined environment where you don't show your feelings or don't show things uh, that you care about. We're in an awkward time where it's the reverse of everything people my age were taught to do in the workplace. Yeah, there's no shame now in, in expression and feeling and sharing. And I think if we did more of that, we'd have a much more human rather than hiding behind the terminology of professionalism and strength and, and pride and, and a sense of, of being able to live through anything. We're going through all this together and perhaps much like 9-11 for a brief period of time, it brought us together. Maybe in 2021, we come out on the other side of that wave uh, we'll have a lot of personal baggage that comes with us, but we will have gone through something, just maybe as Americans, that, that we say humanity has to shine through rather than our discord and our, our difficulties with one another. And in terms of suicide and Misty, some of the statistics that never seem to change or get worse, hopefully we'll also say we can lend a hand and we can be there and yeah. not just listen, but actively listen to people and what they're saying. And sometimes that means really putting your ear <laughs> to the threshold, not, not yeah. saying, oh, this is a platitude. I'm, I'm hearing something that's real, and I'm, I'm hearing something that I have to tune into. And maybe take a deep breath and say, I'm not even sure how to respond, but I'm going to think that. And I think yeah. I know how to make this experience. Anyway, thank you both. Incredible information for all of those. Yeah who are able to participate. This is something we should do, Christine, every quarter, just kind oh, yeah. of a mental health wellness check-in uh, with Jake and Misty that's good for everybody, whether they're chamber members or not. I happen to think being a chamber member is the healthy thing to do, but that's what I'm paid to say. I, I just think it's, it's a really good thing to bring people together in this kind of format. It's probably less intrusive than if I were in a room with you. I'm able to share more because I'm not as exposed. Anyway, thank you both for your expertise and your boldness and your courage. I appreciate it. Thank you so Pleasure. much. Um, and thank you for your leadership, not just for me and for Connor and Camille, but, uh, but for our entire chamber as well. Thank you for leading with vulnerability and authenticity. Uh, so we will go ahead and call it a day. And uh, thank you so much for, yeah. for those who, uh, who were hanging on tough. Uh, we're almost at 1.30, but it's been worth every single extra minute. Um, again, keep eyes on your email for the link to the YouTube uh, video so you can continue to digest and think about these things and those past materials will be sent to you. And of course, contact info for Misty and Jake. So um, thank you all so much again and happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas and Kwanzaa and Hanukkah and all the other wonderful celebrations we have of hope and light. So, yeah. all right. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful Great. day. Well, be well. Bye-bye.